I'm Melanie McDermott, and I'm the Associate Director of the Rutgers Initiative on Climate and Society. And uh, we're just thrilled to see such an amazing turnout, thrilled because you'll all have the opportunity to hear from our wonderful speaker, Bill McKibben, and thrilled because it says, it says to all of us that we here at Rutgers and in the wider community recognize the seriousness of the climate emergency that we face, and we're here to put our heads together and tackle what to do next. And we have a lot of people and organizations to thank for making tonight's discussion on this topic possible. Um, so we have our co-sponsors for this event, which include the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences, the School of Arts and Sciences, all of our wonderful Rutgers campus deans, um, Douglas Residential College, the Dean of Students, the Offices of, uh, of Undergraduate Education, the Rutgers University Student Assembly, the SEBS Governing Council, the Rutgers Business Governing Association, the English Department, the Center for Global Advancement and International Affairs, and our fantastic RUTV Weather Watcher crew who are broadcasting live tonight. Um, and I wanted to give a final shout out to our student organizing committee who have been fantastic, who plan to stay organized, and will be passing around clipboards uh, for those of you to give your information if you want to stay in touch on next steps for action on this crucial issue. And at this time, I'd like to ask our executive dean, uh, Robert Goodman of the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences, to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you very much. Wow, what a crowd. Melanie, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be with you here this evening and to have the honor on your behalf of introducing Bill McKibben to this wonderful Rutgers audience. Bill came down uh, this morning and had a full afternoon meeting with students, faculty, and now this wonderful and avid audience that draws together everyone at Rutgers, schools, students, staff, faculty, members of the local communities, uh, New Brunswick, Highland Park, even a few of us here from Franklin Township and Princeton. So Bill is the leader of a growing, growing crowdsourcing movement, generating leadership across the country and around the world. He wrote the first book for the general audience that he is so gifted at addressing uh, on the issue of climate called the End of Nature, published in 1989. It was about how profoundly our globe has been touched in every corner by human activities. By infliction of environmental changes, first here and there, in pockets, tailings from mining pollution, polluting streams, manure from livestock and fertilizer growing for crops, and pesticides polluting groundwater, environmental damages to parts of our ecosystems. Targets that the environmental movement that started full force with the first Earth Day in 1970 took on as its issues. Wildlife habitat, clean water, clean air, land preservation, conservation, and so forth. But by 1989, Bill taught us things were different. In fact, past different. How the simple molecule, carbon dioxide, the signature of human industry, driven by our relentless pursuit of a better life, had transformed the game, to the point he argued that the effects were global and the end of nature was upon us. Bill is a journalist, a writer. He got his start, maybe not his start, I don't know what you did in high school, Bill, but the Harvard Crimson was certainly a launching point. Uh, I've read that as his time on Harvard Square was coming to an end, that um, the editor of the New Yorker magazine called him with a job offer. Bill thought it was a prank call from the Harvard Lampoon. <laughs> he also brushed off the second call, saying it was not funny the first time. <laughs> Eventually, though, through persistence, the editor convinced Bill that this was the real thing, and Bill accepted, and he wrote for a number of years, Talk of the Town for the New Yorker, uh, years 1982 to 1987, if Wikipedia is right. <laughs> I always have to put that in because 
but he just nodded his head, so I guess it's close. <laughs> the events leading up to Bill's appearance today at Rutgers uh, had a fitting start in a joint act of civil disobedience. Briefly, one of our faculty members went to a rally in front of the White House in opposition to the Keystone XL pipeline in the summer of 2010. David Hughes found himself in a police lineup <laughs> aroused by a stimulating talk by Bill McKibben. They met, they talked, and eventually through the efforts of Melanie McDermott and Robin Lachenko, uh, arrangements were made to bring Bill here. Bill, you have no doubt discovered today much about Rutgers. This is the home to a broad and vigorous community of scholars and students concerned about the major issues of our day. Climate and related issues of energy and governance are central to our work as they are to your cause. We are grateful for all of the ways in which you've interacted with our community today. Freshmen read your work for expository writing, the master class this afternoon for students in the English and the School of Communication and Information, the lunch with faculty leadership, your dinner with student environmental leaders this evening, and for all this, we thank you sincerely. And now, the co-founder of 350.org, the author most recently of Earth Making a Life on a Tough New Planet, the undisputed leader of a global trend in crowdsourcing leadership and climate issues, the man who started it all with the end of nature, but who himself has become a force of nature, Bill McKibben. Thank you so much. That was, that was a very kind introduction, and it's been a very, very pleasant day for me, like a really good day. Um, so good to be here on this campus that is really the, um, we were just talking about this at dinner, the, the sort of central organizing principle for this great state, you know, um, um, the place where New Jersey comes to think about itself in some sense. And of course, you know, New Jersey has a lot to think about uh, right now in, in the wake of the most, some of the most dramatic events in its history in the last few months. So it's been really wonderful for me. I mean, I got to meet all kinds of terrific faculty. Uh, uh, there are I gotta say, you guys have like a lot of centers and initiatives and whatever else um, um, going on. And, and, uh, and I got to meet a lot of tremendous students who are doing great organizing. Now, I think they're passing around those clipboards. I'll explain a little bit more as we go along uh, exactly what it's all about, but you should definitely just sign it on faith in the meantime, okay? And uh, at the worst, it'll be one, you know, one excess email that you can delete. Um, um, it really has been a great day for me, which makes me feel all the guiltier for the fact that, you know, my essential role in life is just to bum people out, you know. Um, and, and that's what I'm going to do for a little while <laughs> here tonight. And I apologize in advance for it. And we will get to better stuff as we go along. But really, um, really, there's no way to do any of this without talking for a minute about where we are scientifically, because unless we understand the scale and the pace of the problem that we face, then we can't figure out at what scale and at what pace we need to be addressing it. Okay. As Dean Goodman points out, I wrote the first book for a general audience about this stuff way back in 1980. 89 IE before many of you were born okay and um, that quarter century ago we kind of knew what was coming uh, in fact the science is remarkably unchanged in many ways since then but what we didn't know was quite how fast it was going to come and on quite what kind of scale scientists by their nature are conservative and cautious far more prone to understate than overstate the trouble that we face. And it was, well, it was psychologically difficult to understand 
that we really were capable of making change at the most fundamental level on this planet. After all, we'd spent 10,000 years in the Holocene, this period of benign climatic stability that underwrote the rise of human civilization. It was difficult to imagine that we really, I mean, there was no human history outside that period, you know. Change has come. It's come very fast. In the lifetime of everybody in this room, we've left behind the Holocene. That's the most important thing that's happened in your lifetimes, and probably by uh, 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 many orders of magnitude. The one thing that our era on Earth will be probably most remembered for. Okay. Um, so far, we've increased the temperature one degree. 25 years ago, we wouldn't have said that that would be enough to cause huge change. It's less than three quarters of a watt of extra solar energy per square meter of the Earth's surface. Okay? But there are a lot of square meters on the Earth's surface, and that extra heat actually has added up to an enormous amount. And all we really need to do I mean, is just kind of look around at, well, even at the last, uh, think of the events of, of, well, think of the events of just the last year. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what happened in the United States in a minute, but um, the biggest thing that happened in 2012, by far, was that the Arctic melted at a kind of catastrophic, uh, cataclysmic fashion. We blew past the old record for minimum sea ice extent in the Arctic on about August 16th, with six weeks left to go in the Arctic melting season. By the time we were done, we had shattered every old record. There was about half as much ice by area and 25% as much ice by volume as when Neil Armstrong looked down from the moon 40 years before, i.e., we had taken one of the largest physical features on Earth and we broke it, okay? Um, other physical features following close behind, we look out at the broad Atlantic and it looks about the same as it always did, beautiful, you know, but if you stick a strip a pH paper in, it comes out a different color than it did 40 years ago. The ocean is about 30% more acidic as the chemistry of seawater changes as it absorbs carbon from the atmosphere. 25 years ago, we didn't even give a thought that that might be happening. The ocean seemed too vast, but it is happening and happening very fast. Here on land, the biggest change that we see probably uh, uh, is the shift in hydrology, the way that water moves around this planet. If you want one physical fact to understand our time on Earth, it is that warm air holds more water vapor than cold. The atmosphere on average is about 5% wetter than it was 40 years ago. That is a staggering change in a basic physical parameter of the Earth. And what it does, of course, is load the dice for both drought and flood. Think about 2012 in the US. It was the warmest year in our history, and it wasn't the warmest by a little bit. I mean, we have, we have a long, long line of temperature records in this country. What that means, any of you who've ever studied statistics know, is that it would be extremely unusual to set a new record, but if you're going to do it, it would come by the smallest of amounts. It would come by a hundredth or a two hundredth or three hundredth of a degree. Last year, we, we broke the old annual temperature record for this country by a full degree. Um, 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 it was astonishing. And if you think about what it felt like, do you remember back to March of last year when sort of summer began while it was still winter uh, all across the country? I mean, in South Dakota, it was 94 degrees two days before the end of winter. Um, 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 I mean, it just that heat swept across the country, a kind of foretaste of what was going to happen as the summer then wore on. You'll recall that uh, epic fire season in Colorado and New Mexico where they set new records for the largest wildfires, and then the heat that started to bake its way east, and then that incredible storm, strange, they called it a Dureco, this sort of straight line hurricane that blew you know, from Indiana all the way to the Atlantic coast and knocked out power to six or seven million Americans. And then the sweltering heat that followed place after place 
day after day, setting record after record, there were lots of places where the low temperature for the day beat the all-time old high temperature mark for that place, something that should be, in essence, statistically impossible. But it happened again and again and again. And of course, that heat took a tremendous toll across the Midwest, um, um, across the most fertile farmland on the face of the earth in a normal year, but not last year. The topsoil was as good as it ever was, but it was too hot to grow things. And so our harvests were horrible. And the result was rise in the price of food, uh, grain around the world of 40, 45 percent. Um, most of us can deal with that. If you buy a box of corn flakes, you pay more for the box than you do for the corn, you know? So it's not the end of the world. But it is the end of the world if you wake up someplace and have to find enough coins to get to the market and buy cornmeal to make tortillas for your family, then rest assured that a 40% increase in the price of corn was the biggest thing that happened in your life last year, you know? Um, and then, of course, we got to the fall. Um, and this storm began to form in the Atlantic. Now, I watched it with a little special dread, I confess, because the year before, another storm had come up pretty much the same track, Hurricane Irene, but it just jogged a little bit, a little bit east. And it went up and decimated my state, Vermont. Uh, it was the biggest thing that ever happened there. Um, um, we lost 500 miles of state highway, dozens of bridges, towns cut off for days. It was. Um, um, incredible. So I was scared when I saw it coming. As it turned out, Hurricane Sandy didn't make that same jog east. It came right straight down at you guys. And it hit the Jersey Shore with a, you know, just unbelievable fury. And it hit, you know, it hit the greatest city on the face of the earth pretty much square on. Um, those pictures are in their way as resonant as the pictures from 9-11, you know? Um, um, the image of the cold Atlantic pouring into the New York City subway system is as stark a reminder as one's likely to get of the fragility of the civilization that we have built at this point. All right? And here's the scary part about all of this. Everything that I've described is what happens when you raise the temperature one degree. Now, the people who told us that that was going to happen, the scientists, and who predicted with some accuracy what it would mean, now tell us with robust confidence that unless we get our act together very quickly, unless we get off coal and gas and oil far more quickly than any government's currently planning to, that one degree will be four or five degrees before the younger people in this room are old, okay? And there is no reason to think that our civilization, none at all, can cope with changes like that. If one degree melts the Arctic, try to imagine what four or five degrees might do. The agronomists who take in the most you know, basic question uh, all human beings ever ask, you know, what's for dinner, and tried to tried to kind of analyze it in this light, I mean, the, the, the numbers are petrifying. Um, the team from Stanford and the University of Washington published a paper a couple of years ago saying, from this point on, we can expect that every degree increase in global average temperature should cut grain yields about 10%. And if you watched what happened in Iowa last summer, you have no problem imagining that that's completely possible. Okay. If we raise the temperature two or three or four degrees, maybe we cut grain yields 20, 30 percent. Try to imagine this planet with 20 percent fewer calories on it, okay? Try to imagine what that means for development, for war and peace, for uh, uh, public health, for women's rights, for all the things that we care about on this planet. There is no way that we can cope with a world like that. This is already far and away the largest thing that humans have ever done on this earth. And the only question is how bad we're going to make it, okay? And, 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 and the only 
task for us, the overriding task, far above all the other issues that we all have to deal with is as a civilization, can we slow this down enough that we not stop global warming, that's no longer on the list of options, but slow it down enough that it doesn't overwhelm everything else around us. And that's all I want to talk about tonight. Can we do that? We're through the scary, hard numbers stuff you can breathe and, um, and, 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 and sort of gird yourself for the um, emotionally easier but sort of personally harder question of whether or not you're ready to be a part of the fight to do something about it, okay? Um, and we need to understand sort of what that fight is about and how it's gonna work. The way it should work, the way it should have worked long ago is straightforward and simple. You know, for 25 years now, the best scientists in America have gone up to Capitol Hill every year and explained to our politicians that the worst thing that ever happened in the world's happening. And they've been followed by our, you know, uh, best economists speaking with uh, practical unanimity about the fact that we needed to put a price on carbon and they've been followed by the policy people explaining all the ways that we could do things like that without were reason the coin of the realm here we would long since have started doing things taking action getting someplace okay if we'd started 25 years ago, we wouldn't have solved the problem by now, but we'd be well on our way to solving the problem. We'd have corrected the sort of trajectories. We'd be moving in the right direction here and around the world, and instead we're not. As a planet, we pour more carbon into the atmosphere each year. So the trick is figuring out why reason hasn't worked very well. And there are a number of answers to that having to do with human psychology and things, but the biggest answer, the most straightforward and important answer is simply that there's too much power on the other side. The biggest, richest industry in the history of the planet is the fossil fuel industry. And it has effectively and skillfully used that money in order to buy enough influence to make sure that nothing ever changes. Okay? And they continue to do it right through this moment. I mean, two weeks before the last election, Chevron made the biggest campaign contribution uh, in the post-Citizens United era. Okay? And they did it to make sure that our Congress would remain in the hands of people unwilling to face the even simplest truths about climate, and they were successful. So the odds of congressional action in the next couple of years are somewhere between slim and none. Okay? Um, what that means is that if we're going to build an effective response, it won't be solely by reason. We will have to figure out a way to build something strong enough to stand up to that power. We'll have to build a different power. We're not going to outspend the fossil fuel movement, that, uh, the fossil fuel industry. That's not one of the possibilities. Instead, we're going to have to find other currencies to work in, the currencies of movements, passion, spirit, creativity, numbers. Those are the things that I want to talk about a little bit tonight. I talk about them somewhat abashedly because I'm no great expert on building movements. It's not at all what I anticipated I was going to spend my life doing. I'm a writer, okay? Um, if you think about it, um, well, I mean, if you think about it, writers are exactly the opposite in a way of activists. I mean, you know, I, I'm, it's very nice to be here with you and whatever, but left to my own devices, I'd rather be in my room typing, you know? Um, that's what I like to do. If writers had some other way to kind of express themselves, uh, we probably wouldn't be writers, you know? Um, 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 so you'll forgive me then for you know, not being the great orator that, that y you might want. But some years ago, it became clear to me that we were not seeing the change that we needed and that this lack of movement was one reason, and so we would need to try and build one. And uh, 
I don't know why we had any idea that we might could do this, because we had no reason really to think that we would be able to. When I say we, the crew that started 350.org was myself and seven undergraduates at Middlebury College in Vermont, where I hang out. Um, but we decided we were going to try. And we had no money and no organization. Um, but for some reason, that wasn't worrying us. What worried us was we thought we have to organize globally, but how do we do that on a planet where everybody insists on speaking their own language? Okay? What's the way we would do that? That seemed to us the insuperable obstacle. Until I thought about my friend Jim Hansen at NASA, our great climate scientist, and I called him up and I said, you know what, we need a number to work with here. Really, are we at the point, this was 2007, when we can say how much carbon is too much? He said, I've been kind of wondering the same question. I'm going to put my team to work. And four months later, in January of 2008, they produced a paper that's probably the most important scientific paper of the millennia to date. It said, um, we know enough about carbon. Any value in the atmosphere greater than 350 parts per million is not compatible with the planet on which civilization developed and to which life on Earth is adapted. That's strong language for scientists to use, those of you who are used to reading abstracts. It's stronger language still when you know that outside tonight, you know, in, in, in New Jersey and, and in New Guinea, it is 395 parts per million CO2, and it's going up by two parts per million per year. We're already way past where we should be, hence the melting Arctic. So that was a depressing paper to read. But it did give us this number, 350. We said, OK, we'll take that. You wouldn't normally name a kind of movement after a wonky scientific data point. However, the advantage of Arabic numerals is that they skip lightly across those linguistic boundaries that words can't penetrate. 350 means, you know, the same thing wherever you go. Um, um, and so we started this thing we called 350.org. Uh, there were seven undergraduates working with me, and there are seven continents. So each one of them took one, and we went to work. The guy who took the Antarctic also had to take the internet, okay? Um, <laughs> and, 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 and off we went. And our job was to find people like ourselves. Now, there's not every place around the world somebody called an environmentalist, but there's every place someone working on women's issues, on hunger, on peace, on development, on the things you can't have in a degrading world. And they were our natural partners. And we found them. And we asked them all, would you please, well, we have to figure out a way to make a little splash. Let's start. We picked a date in the fall of 2009, about a year after we started, and said, uh, do something on this day to draw attention to this number and to this problem so that people around the world know it. And we didn't know if it would work. And we had no real reason to think it would. But we got a sense two days early that it might actually kind of work. We were sitting around our little, you know, one room office around a table, the eight of us with our laptops open doing last minute press releases in many languages and things. And the phone rang and it was our leader in uh, Ethiopia on the satellite phone. And she was in tears, like many of our leaders. We're all, I mean, I'm a volunteer, almost everybody's a volunteer. She was a 17 year old girl. Um, um, she was in tears. She said, the government took away our permit for Saturday for our rally. So we're doing it today before they can stop us, which was brave. But that wasn't why she was crying. She was like, we were so looking forward to doing this the same day as everybody else. We so want to be part of the big thing. We don't want to spoil it for everybody. We so want to do it at the same time. And we have 15,000 kids right now out in the street in Addis Ababa chanting 350. Okay. So I was like, well, don't worry about the date. It's OK, you know. Um, 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 um. And it was OK. And it was actually quite amazing. For the, next, uh, for the next 48 hours, the pictures just rolled. The next one came from US troops in Afghanistan. And 350 was sandbagged, saying we were uh, parking our Humvee for the weekend and walking. Okay? But the, 
the pictures rolled in from every corner of the world. There were, before the weekend was out, there had been 5,200 demonstrations in 181 countries, what CNN called the most widespread day of political activity in the planet's history. I could show you many thousands of pictures. I'll show you just a few. Um, the main reason I show them, for those of you who are willing to work on this stuff, is I want you to see who your brothers and sisters in this fight are, okay? And because it always cheers me up and it always makes me want to fight the harder. I was telling people at dinner, one of the things I've always been told as an environmentalist was that environmentalism was just something that rich white people did and that if you worried where your next meal was coming from, you wouldn't be an environmentalist and on and on and on. It just turns out it's complete nonsense. I mean, most of the people that we worked with around the world were poor and black and brown and Asian and young because that's what most of the world is made up of. I mean, they're, you know, that's someplace on the Congo River above Kinshasa. Those are dugout canoes. These guys didn't have a digital camera. They developed it in someone's home dark room. It didn't come out very well. They wrote in what their banner had said. But the reason I show it to you is just to say, you know, there you are near where Conrad, in his Eurocentric way, identified the planet's heart of darkness, you know. Um, and there's people completely and utterly engaged in this fight, understanding its stakes and its consequences, and understanding that they play a role. And, and so it was beautiful to see those pictures coming in from every corner of creation, you know. Um, very wonderful to see, for the first time, big involvement of religious communities in this fight. There's the head of Muslim South Africa, the sort of leader of indigenous traditions, Behind them in scarlet, uh, Desmond Tutu's successor as Anglican Archbishop at the head of a huge multi-faith march. There's you know, our biggest evangelical college in, in this country, Billy Graham's alma mater, a place that even a few years ago would not have had an environmental, it would have been seen as sort of pagan and, and whatever, and, and it was so good. I'd been to Bethlehem to do some organizing, not an easy place to get to, you know, but the Dead Sea has shrunk many feet uh, as the climate uh, has warmed, and so people wanted to do something. There's too many military barriers in the way to make it easy, so the Jordanians said, we'll make the big three on our beach. The Palestinians said, we'll take care of the five on our shore. The Israelis said, we'll do the zero close to home. It was actually quite beautiful to see 300 big demonstrations across China, which is important. You know, one of them got broken up by the police, not an easy place to do this kind of work, but the rest went off and, and, and continue to do a lot of work there. Um, those are our, um, that's the Student Government Association of the Maldive Islands in the Indian Ocean. The Maldives is a 5,000 year old culture, okay? The odds of it becoming a 5,100-year-old culture are pretty small. The highest point in the archipelago is about a meter and a half above sea level. Okay? So they're working hard um, to illustrate. I mean, there they are meeting in the lagoon to kind of make the point. Uh, this was the biggest story on Google News for about 36 hours, more things linking to it. And the reason, I think, was because to editors, it looked different from what their expectation of an environmentalist was sort of supposed to look like. So there we are in Yemen, about the toughest place on the planet, really. And you know, if you look at that zero closely, it's all women in full black burqa. To us, they do not look, you know, like members of the Sierra Club, but their, their hearts and exactly the same place. They're not thinking about themselves. They're thinking about the future. They're thinking about their kids and their grandkids and about what the world's going to look like. Uh, you know, there's um, the oil-rich sheikdom of Abu Dhabi. Uh, you can see some oil-rich sheikhs down front in their dish dashes, okay? But these are smarter than your average oil tycoons, all right? If you look behind them, you see the edge of the largest solar array on the planet. Um, these guys' plan, I believe, is to remain rich no matter what happens, okay? <laughs> and, and good on them for, you know, that resolve. There were also, I confess, four or five hundred pictures that just ended up in a file marked 350 adorable, okay? <laughs> and, and they really were adorable. And they really were hard to look at, too. Um, chances are those girls will be refugees in their lifetime. Okay? And not, of course, through anything that they've done. One of the things to always remember about most of these pictures is that they come from places where no one's caused any of this problem at all. They just get the pain, all right? 
Um, so I could show you pictures like this for a very long time. We've gone on to do four of these big global days of action all over the world. We've organized almost 20,000 demonstrations in every country on earth except North Korea. Um, and it's been beautiful and fun. We have friends everywhere and it's amazing to kind of see what they look like. And in some of the toughest places on the planet, you know, and, and just um, powerful and colorful and, 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 and gorgeous. These are our, you know, these are our really good friends all over the world. We've done huge art projects. Some of you may know um, Tom York from Radiohead. Uh, that's, he assembled 3,000 of his best friends and gave them blue raincoats and there they stood on the uh, shore at Brighton Beach in the UK forming an image as King Canute trying to hold back the waters, you know, uh, uh, as they rise. This is, we did this one day art project that was, you know, we had images so big that's thousands of people in the DR making, that, that the only way we could actually capture them was to while we got a company donated half a million dollars in satellite time to take pictures from space of what was going on, you know, and they were, they were beautiful. There's uh, 3,000 people in Santa Fe holding blue sheets above their head as the satellite goes over to bring this dry riverbed back to life, you know. Very powerful. Um, we've done a good job of educating people around the world who didn't really know what was happening, including in many parts of this country. And that's one of the things that movements have to do. They're about spreading awareness and building. But it's not the only thing that movements have to do. Given the time with which we have in, to work, which is not very much, it's imperative that we figure out very quickly how to take that awareness and turn it into meaningful action action that might be on a level that has something to do with the scale of the problem that we face, okay? And so in the last couple of years, that's what we've been trying very hard to do. I wanna tell a couple of stories just very quickly here. Uh, the first is about work that we began now 18 months ago. And it's about the tar sands in Canada, all right? Now, I had known in a kind of offhand way that there was bad stuff going on up there for a number of years, because I'd been hearing from native friends of mine up in Canada that it was really out of control. And, or, and in fact, it is. The mining project in this tar sands is on a scale that you almost can't believe. They've only got 3% of the oil out so far, but they've already moved more earth than they moved for the 10 biggest dams on earth and the Suez Canal and the Great Wall of China, okay? Uh, uh, go on Google Earth and look at it if you don't believe me. It's insane, okay? But look, there's 10 of these kind of things going on around the world at any given moment, and how do you prioritize them and go to work? In the spring of 2011, Jim Hansen at NASA put out a little paper saying people might want to pay attention because the tar sands up there are the second biggest pool of carbon on Earth. If we could torch it all off tonight, which thank God we can't, but if you could, if you burned all the recoverable oil up there, you'd raise the planetary concentration of CO2 from 390 parts per million to 540 parts per million, okay? That's how much carbon's up in there. And at that point, in the spring of 2011, there was a plan for this big pipeline, the Keystone XL pipeline, to come to XL, I believe, for extra large, to come down out of those tar sands to the Gulf of Mexico. And it was a done deal. I mean, it was ready to go. The contracts were signed. The pipe was procured and so on. They were just waiting for the last piece of paper they needed, which was for the president to sign off on a permit that it was in the national interest. There's an old and somewhat obscure law that requires that when infrastructure crosses a border, it requires a presidential permit. And this has mostly been used in the past for like bridges from New Brunswick to, you know, Maine and things like that. But in this case, it meant that the president had to sign. He hadn't done it yet. Um, and we decided that we better try to fight it. As Jim Hansen said, as Jim Hansen said, if you burn all that stuff up there on top of what we're already burning, then it's essentially game over for the climate. All right? There's another five or six places around the world with concentrations of carbon large enough that the same thing is true. But this was one of them, and it was an active decision. 
Nobody knew about this pipeline, nobody at all. I mean, less than one half of 1% in Americans and Poles had even heard of it, okay? And so we decided that the time was right to use one of the tools in the activist toolbox, one that we don't use all that often, but that we keep sharp when we need it, and that's some um, civil disobedience. And so we sent out a letter. I wrote a letter, and a bunch of my friends, you know, Naomi, Naomi Klein and Wendell Berry and others, signed on and asked people to come to Washington, and come they did. In the course of those two weeks, 1,253 of us went to jail. Um, it was the largest civil disobedience action in 30 years in this country, and I'm so grateful to the people here who joined us in that fight and on those lines, and I really am. Um, by the time it was done, we were kind of in the game, you know? Um, it was beautiful to see as people lined up one after another to go off to jail um, um, and to see it spread to other countries. The biggest civil disobedience action in Canada in many years as they began this huge fight up there. And then around the world, our allies, you know, doing the same thing. And then people following the president all fall fall of 2011 as he began his campaign, very respectful, but wherever he went, on any campus, there were big crowds of young people and they'd be chanting, yes, we can stop the pipeline. Um, um, and then we came back to Washington, this time not to get arrested, this time I'd said, maybe we can figure out if we can circle the White House, because I don't think it's ever been done before, let's try and do it. And we didn't know if we could. We, uh, my crew was on Google Earth sort of trying to count how many people it would take to go around. We figured if we got 3,000 and they stretched out their arms, we might just make it around this mile and a half. As it turned out, we needn't have worried. So many people showed up that we were pretty much shoulder to shoulder, five deep around the White House. And it was a beautiful day. And four days later, the president said, okay, uh, we'll review this for a year. Um, so maybe that was a cynical thing because it took it past the election and maybe it was a real thing. We'll find out because now the year's up and it's under active consideration again, okay? And in the intervening year, you know, Mother Nature filed her public testimony. We had the hottest year in American history. If there was any doubt that it was a good idea or not, it should have been conclusively settled. But as I said before, uh, that's not what carries the day in Washington. What carries the day is power. And the fossil fuel industry has a ton of it. And so we need to assemble a ton of it. That is why there are people out there trying to sign you up to take a bus to Washington the Sunday after next. We're gonna assemble a big crowd out on the mall and we're gonna make a human pipeline. And, and, we're going, to remind, we're going to remind the president that nobody has forgotten about this thing in the intervening year. Um, I don't know whether we can win this thing. Everybody keeps saying that we can't, that the conventional wisdom right from the beginning has been that, that, that they build the pipeline. But you know what? So far we've stopped it for nearly 15 months. And at 900,000 barrels of oil a day, that's closing in on 400 and 15 or 20 million barrels of oil that we have together kept in the ground. And that's a good thing. It doesn't stop global warming, but it's, you know, I spent three days in jail and that was well worth it, all right? And we gotta keep going, we gotta keep trying. However, one thing that that experience has taught us is that as important as it is to play defense against terrible projects, it's not enough, all right? There are simply too many pipelines, too many coal mines, too many oil wells to be able to win this sort of playing defense one at a time. They just, you know, overwhelm us. So we also got to figure out how to play some offense, how to take down to some degree the power of this industry to determine events. And really the reason, the other reason beyond trying to recruit you to come to Washington that I'm here tonight is to talk about what that offense is starting to look like because something really unusual and interesting is starting to happen on American college campuses in these last six or eight, 10 weeks. All of a sudden, what the Nation Magazine said last week was the largest student movement in several decades has come out of nowhere. 
Um, and it's a movement that we need your help with to get these institutions to divest their holdings in these fossil fuel companies. <laughs> to, make, to make a profound statement to make a profound statement that even though none of us can entirely avoid using fossil fuel at this point, we can sure as hell avoid profiting from it. If it is wrong to wreck the climate, then it is wrong to profit from that wreckage, period. End of story. Now, we got started with this last summer. I wrote a piece for Rolling Stone. Um, for those of you who keep your back issues, it was the one with Justin Bieber on the cover, okay? Um, but here was the weird thing. I got a call from the editor a couple of days later saying, something strange is going on. Your piece has 10 times as many likes on Facebook as Justin Bieber's. Uh, and, you know, partly that's, you know, of course due to my sort of soulful stare, you know, but, but, but mostly it's because uh, it laid out the math of where we were in a new way. And all it took was three numbers to... Okay, so three numbers, very easy math. Two degrees, that's how much the world's agreed we could raise the temperature. It's the only thing the world's agreed on. You'll recall that disastrous climate conference in Copenhagen, which, you know, if the movie had come out the way it should, would have been the place where the world come together and so it didn't, okay? The only thing that we agreed on, there was this bogus two-page statement at the end, no timetables, no enforcement, no anything. No, all it had was this agreement that the world's government said two degrees would be too much, okay? Uh, in fact, it would be way too much. We've raised the, you know, we raised it one degree. We see what happens doubling that stupid, but we are going, the only, we are going to double it, okay? The only question is if we're gonna be able to hold the line there or not, and it'll take a huge effort to do it. So two degrees. Second number. 565 gigatons of carbon. That's how much we can pour into the atmosphere between now and 2050 and have some hope of staying below two degrees. All right, uh, 565 billion tons. It sounds like a lot. It is a lot, but at current rates of burning, we blow past it in about 15 years, okay? So that's scary. That's not a good number, but the worst number is the third number, and it was the new one, and it came from a team of financial analysts in the UK who had added up from SEC filings and annual reports and things like that, how much carbon the world's fossil fuel companies had in their reserves. And that number turns out to be 2,795 gigatons, or five times as much as the most conservative governments on Earth think would be safe to burn. Okay, so that was a new number. And once you knew that new number, then you understood the fix we were in in a different way. There's no longer any room for speculation, or doubt, or wishful thinking, or anything. I mean, this end of this story is now written, unless we figure out very quickly how to rewrite it. And it'll be hard as hell to rewrite it, because 
they'd have to keep 80% of those reserves in the ground, all right? And that would mean that they would lose a lot of money, okay? So it's very hard to force Exxon to do that, all right? But it's probably easier than trying to get physics to change its mind, okay? <laughs> those are the two possibilities. It's not like there's some third interesting, easy, simple way out that does. Those are the possibilities, all right? If they carry out their business plan, the planet tanks. Do we think that other mic is working? Okay, good. I'll get to this. While, while you mull that over, I'll get back up. So, once you know those numbers, then you understand those companies in a new way. They're not normal companies anymore. At one point they were, and they served a useful social function, and we like fossil fuels. They are now rogue companies. They are outlaw, not against the laws of the state, they mostly get to write those, but outlaw against the laws of physics, all right? And that means that those of us who profit from them, own them, participate in them, are participating in that, in that sadness. And so when that article came out and people responded, then we said, let's go on tour around the country and try to spread this word. And we did, and we got a bus, biodiesel bus. It was great. It was Johnny Cash's old bus driver, you know, and we went around the country and give these talks, these big sold out concert halls, and then climb in the bus and go to sleep and wake up in a new city. And we did 24 cities in 26 nights, I think. Um, um, and it was great, that was in November. We started the night after the election, all right? And by the time we were done, here was the really good part. There were 234 college campuses with active divestment fights on them, including right now this one, all right? Those, those students and faculty and staff and alumni cannot bankrupt Exxon. That's not the point, okay? The point is we're gonna try and strip away some of their veneer of respectability, take away their social license as it were. Try to remove some of the power and the cachet with which they dominate our politics and the politics of many other places. It is an epic fight, and this is suddenly the white hot front of that fight. And so we need you very much to go to work. We need you if you are students, and we need you if you are staff and administrators, and we need you if you are faculty. Alumni. And alumni. <laughs> and alumni, very much so. <laughs> alumni may have noticed that their college retains an interest in them after they graduate, okay? Um, so important to, you know. It's important for faculty, I said at lunchtime today, um, if there's anybody in this room who happens to have tenure, okay, then this is aimed particularly at you. You have not the slightest excuse for not helping in every possible way, okay? Um, um, I'll just show you a couple more pictures before I stop, just to remind you what the stakes are. We did this day last spring called um, Connect the Dots, and we asked people to rally in places around the world that had already felt the sting of climate change, okay? And even though we're used to this, we were not used for what the outpouring was gonna be like. They came, the day starts in the Pacific, so the first pictures come in from underwater in the Marshall Islands where the coral reefs just, you know, not doing very well in that hot, acid ocean. But, you know, you would think that people in Afghanistan would have other things they had to worry about, but the Kabul River drying up is pretty, you know, pretty much there. Uh, or, 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 or the drought in Africa, or the sea level rise in New Zealand. Some places the problems aren't quite as terrible, um, um, but they're still bad enough, you know. Um, um, uh, we should be able to ski, and it's sad that we can't, you know. And forest fire across the boreal north, you know, and, 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 and sea level rise 
in, in, in low-lying nations. There's, that top balloon is where the level of the Dead Sea used to be 40 years ago, okay? Uh, that picture came from a village in India, and all, all it had was a little note just attached to it, just said, there is no water behind our dam anymore. Okay. You know, um, um, the opposite problem in Pakistan, those people live in the zone where 20 million people were displaced by flooding uh, in the September of 2010. 20 million people. So think about the dislocation that Hurricane Sandy caused and the trauma and the horror and the sadness and then multiply it by some incredible factor to get to 20 million people out of their homes, you know, a quarter of that nation underwater at this point. Um, all over the world, there we are in Vermont, the uh, damage from Hurricane Irene to our farm field still visible a year later. And just place after place after place after place after place. That picture may have grabbed me the most. It was one of the smallest demonstrations of the day, if only because of those signs on the edge that those two children are holding. It's, Your actions affect me, which is absolutely right. Actually, more people died in Haiti from Hurricane Sandy than in New York or in New Jersey, and there's still a full-on cholera outbreak there in its wake, okay? Your actions affect me, but not the other way around. There's nothing that those guys can do except call on our sympathy to change how this story comes out. They don't, you can't burn less fossil fuel. They don't burn any now. They don't have the headquarters of big fossil fuel companies to go protest outside. They can't get, you know, in a three-hour bus ride to the capital of the world's sole superpower, you know. Um, that's our job. We caused a lot of this problem, and we can do something about this problem. And college campuses are one of the places where we've got to do it. This college, like many others, has spent part of the last decade boasting about how seriously it took sustainability and how it was going to build green buildings and how it was going to study the heck out of this thing and so on and so forth. Um, the portfolio is no different than the art center or the dining hall. It's a part of the campus. And if you're going to green one, you should green the whole thing. And you should especially do it at a college because one of the things that is so clear and so both sort of tender and um, slightly heartbreaking always about colleges is that it's the place where we enact the kind of passing on of generations, you know. I said at dinner, perhaps not as subtly as I should have, that really a college is a place where you know, old people teach young people things, okay? And, and that's good and beautiful, but in this case, it's young people who have real claim to make on all of us. If you look at those charts of what's happening to the climate, those of us who have 20 years left on this planet might just sort of make it through halfway unscathed. Maybe there'll be some more Sandys or things, but probably well-off first-worlders will manage to make it through. But there is no way, if you have 60 or 70 years left on this planet, like undergraduates here, that you will make it out unscathed unless we change course very fast. And so there's something almost obscene about paying for the educations of people with investments in companies whose business plan guarantees there will be no planet to carry out that education on. That's why it's time to divest. Let me just end on that same theme by telling you two stories quickly about those arrests in Washington, because they still stick in my mind. Okay, there were two things about them that were interesting. One was when we sent out the um, letter asking people to come, one of the things I said was, I don't think young people, college students, should have to be the cannon fodder here. Okay, they've been the leaders of the climate movement here and around the world. But if you're, you know, 21 right now in our economy, it's possible that an arrest record is not the single best thing you need on your record. It'll be, you guys can go ahead and, you know, sit in at the president's office or something, be okay. But, but it's not maybe one of the few unmixed blessings of growing older is 
past a certain point, what the hell are they going to do to you? You know? <laughs> um, and, and, and so it was with some pleasure that we watched lots of people arrive in Washington with hairlines that looked more or less like mine, okay? And we did not say to people as they got arrested, how old are you? Because that would be rude. But we did say cleverly, who was president when you were born, okay? <laughs> and the two biggest cohorts came from the FDR and the Truman administration, so, all right? And on the last day, there was a guy arrested with a sign around his neck that said, World War II veteran handle with care. Now, he was so old that he'd been born in the Warren Harding administration, okay? I actually, theoretically, majored in history, but I had forgotten that there was a Warren Harding <laughs> administration, all right? Um, 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 the point I'm trying to make young people is your elders are beginning to act the way that elders are supposed to act, all right? And that's good, and we need it to continue in a serious way, all right? Second thing that was interesting about those demonstrations was, we said, and you saw the pictures, if you want to come get arrested, would you please wear a necktie or a dress, okay? Not because, I mean, I live in Vermont, you know, basically we just kind of wrap ourselves in fleece and make it through the winter, you know? Um, we're not big dressy types, but we wanted to make a point, and it was the same point that undergirds everything I've told you tonight, if you think about it, which is, there is not the slightest thing radical about what I'm talking about. Nothing at all. All we're asking for is a planet that works a little bit like the one we were born onto, the one that every human being whose history we know about and the whole Holocene was born onto. That's not a rat. That's, if you think about it, that's basically a conservative request. Okay? Radicals work at all companies. If you are willing to make a fortune, by altering the chemical composition of the atmosphere in ways that scientists have told you are deeply damaging and whose effects you can already see in places like the melting Arctic, if you are willing to do that, then you are engaged in a more radical act than any human before you has engaged in. All right? And it is our job to figure out how to check that radicalism and to do it fast. Um, since I'm a writer and not an organizer, I, I got to be honest with you as I close. And I was honest with students today, tonight at dinner. It's possible, I mean, there's no guarantee any of this is going to work. It's possible we've waited too long to get started. There are scientists who think the momentum is simply too large, and there are certainly political scientists who think there's too much money piled up on the other side, and we don't have a chance. And they might be right. If you were a betting person, you might be inclined to bet that we're going to lose because we've lost so far. But the stakes of that wager are so high that I don't think you really are allowed morally to make that bet. I think at this point, the only job for people is to figure out how they can shift those odds a little bit. And that's more than enough for any of us to try to do, to do everything we can to try and move those odds. I can't guarantee you it's going to work. Not at all. I wouldn't try. I can guarantee you, because I've spent the last four or five years on the move around the planet spewing carbon behind me, I can guarantee you that every place around the world there are people who are willing to make the effort. And it's always moving to be in those rooms with those people especially in places where they haven't caused the problem. It's always an honor to be in those rooms and see that fight. And it is an honor to be in this room tonight with you all to say thanks for what you've already done and thanks more for what you will do. And just to say without knowing if we're going to win or not, that it'll be a great, great privilege to just get to stand shoulder to shoulder with you all and fight and find out. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Are you willing to take a few questions from the crowd? 
Okay, please, we've got two microphones. Please come forward. Um, we've got at best 10 minutes, so try to make your questions concise. And, I, and I'm sorry for having rattled on as long as I did. I'm, I'm tired, and when I get tired, I, get, I just kind of ramble, and I apologize. Bill, it's so qu good to see that sign. That's good. I was there. I know it. Uh, uh, my question will help you emphasize a couple of points that you made. Uh, in 2000, and, in your 2010 book, Earth, you projected that sometime in the future, heavy rainfall from extreme weather would cause damage in Vermont, Vermont's infrastructure. Ironically, a year later in 2011, while you were leading the tar sands action, Irene caused a hundred, over $100 million damage in Vermont. Also ironically, that if, if you alter one number in the do the math scheme, if you change the fossil fuel reserves to the amount of carbon dioxide we put in the atmosphere every year, you get a good idea of the 15 years that you That's talked right. about. So would you talk about those two points again? Sure. Look, let's just talk about, since I want to, I got to move quick, let's just talk about money for a moment, okay? There's sometimes people who say we've got to, um, uh, you know, it's too expensive to deal with climate change. We just can't afford it. I mean, you guys by now have figured out watching Sandy that it's like way too expensive not to deal with it. Um, economists are better at adding than subtracting for the most part, you know. Um, um, and they don't always, you know, they're better at adding up what all the costs are going to be to change. Look, the one big economic study of how much it costs to just let the planet heat up, Nicholas Stern in the UK, uh, for the British government found that the cost of unchecked climate change is greater than World War I, World War II, and the Great Depression combined. Okay? We don't have that kind of money to play around with. So it's time we got serious and a little frugal and started making the changes that in the pretty short run will pay off pretty big. Hi, Bill. Thank you for coming. Um, I just wondered if you knew of um, a man who lives in Hopewell his name is Mike Strizki, S-T-R-I-Z-K-I. -I. Um, he's been living far off the grid for close to 10 years. He has a solar hydrogen installation on his property, and um, he's, he has a zero carbon footprint. And it's very safe, it's proven. And he's kind of amazing, and I know he would love to give you and anyone here a tour. And this is a good, you know, I'm very glad you brought this up, because one of the things that I didn't say but should have is we're really at the point now where we understand what the answers to these things look like, and we're beginning to see them in action, sometimes in people's particular homes, sometimes in whole countries. There's one nation on Earth that's taken climate change, one large, one non-Scandinavian nation that's taken this relatively seriously. And that's Germany, and they've done some pretty remarkable things. There were days this summer when Germany generated more than half the power it used from solar panels within its borders, okay? That's pretty astonishing because Munich is north of Montreal. I mean, they do not have Florida and Texas and California and Nevada and New Mexico to kind of pad out their numbers, all right? It's proof that, I mean, really, those of you who've been to Germany, it's sort of foggy and Wagnerian, you know? Um, 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 it's, 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 you know, proof that what we lack is political will, and I guess the good news is political will is something we can generate if we care enough to generate it. Thanks for coming. I'd like to make two points, one perhaps a little sad. Um, I don't know if you're aware, you may well be, that uh, the tar sand oil is being imported to the United States in very substantial quantities via rail lines right. right now. Um, and it's being brought in because it goes to refineries that are particularly targeted at handling that heavy, very heavy, dense oil. Um, and the cost is not substantially greater by rail than it is by pipeline. Point two. Um, amazingly, on the radio just before I came in here, Ralph Izzo, a physicist and CEO of PSE&G, was speaking about his responsibility to uh, represent shareholders and convert their investment into dollars and that his only real purpose, that of PSE&G, was a transfer agent 
there was much to my sadness because I've spoken with him, not a statement about any responsibility to any of the customers in a substantial way. I think there are many opportunities to deal with this um, more aggressively. So I think this is right. And I think one of the lessons is don't spend an enormous amount of time hoping that companies are going to do this on their own. Um, that's not to say that corporations, I mean, when corporations are, somebody asked me, uh, people have asked me a number of times about like the Citizens United decision and you know corporations and free speech and so on and so forth. And the way that it's sort of, I thought about it eventually was the problem with treating corporations as human beings is not that they're immoral or anything, it's that they're simple. Um, you know, when you have a job to do, that's what you want. Uh, they're good at things. They can organize lots of capital and things and very efficiently put it to use. So if you want to go dig up the tar sands or drill in the art, I mean, the corporation is a useful way to get it done. But it's not a good way, it's not the right people to ask if the question is, should we go dig up the tar sands, all right? Because you know what, it's like asking bees whether honey would be a good idea or not, okay? This is what they do, okay? And, and human beings are more, the beauty of us as human beings is that we're not necessarily simple. Yes, we do have instinctual cravings and desires and things that lead us, but we also have complicating factors, you know? There's art and there's religion, and there's uh, uh, things that, you know, uh, we have places like this where we come together and, you know, do strain, look at poems and, and what, and end up doing things that run somewhat counter sometimes to those instincts, and that's the glory of being human. And so it's not fair to get mad at companies for behaving like companies. Our job is to do the things, make the laws, make the rules and regulations that guide that energy in a productive way. And we're perfectly capable of doing that. Our problem is that we're letting them push us around at the moment. And that's why divestment is such a powerful thing. It's a way to assert that we need control over this process, that we're not going to let the biggest companies on earth simply dominate the politics beyond all else. So good question. Hi, thank you, it's great to see you. Um, and it's great to be here with all these people who are thinking more or less what I'm thinking. Um, but I'm here to ask um, actually your advice. Mm. I started a 501c3 designed to kind of move the needle in terms of awareness in America mm. about global climate change, but anything green. Mm -hmm. And it's called the Viral Green Video Contest. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to attract videos that have a green message, some of which will become popular. Um, and I'm kind of, it's a lot of OJT, I'm learning as I go. And uh, any suggestions for a new 501c3? About how to make things go viral, you mean? No, no, don't worry okay. about that. Okay. Um, just worry about that, although yes, that's a, one of the worries, but that's way down. But more about how to get interest and how to get funding and how to get that kind of thing. Oh, I'm, I'm, that's the, you know, I'm the wrong, person to add. This is why I work with, I have, you know, my, my whole, we now have, 350.org has a staff of like about 30 people now spread out around 191 countries. So not very big, but all of them are under the age of 30. That's the secret, okay? Um, <laughs> they're all incredibly hardworking and incredibly technologically adept. And things that t take me, you know, three and a half hours to do, they can do in a, and they come with, and I think this is important, uh, an instinctive sense of the way the world is connected up now. Yeah. It wasn't before. And that's a great help in organizing. So I, my only advice would be find uh, some young people, uh, you know, find as many 20-somethings as you can to work with. I mean, you're pretty close to 20-something yourself. That's right. Find, that's right. Find sir. some others. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we can only take a couple more questions, but on the note of that last question, if there are any Rutgers students or younger in the house who would like to ask a question, I think no one would object if they came to the front of the queue. So let's just have a few more questions with this gentleman and, and 
Stand up, don't be shy. We want to hear from you. Okay. Uh, first, I want to thank you, Bill. I met you the, uh, about 15 years ago, and uh, we were at a conference in Albuquerque about media education, which I'm going to expand on real briefly if I can in a moment. But I think email and the internet were around then, and I don't remember how you communicated this to me, Bill, and I'm sure you won't remember. But this guy is such a nice guy, and in Yiddish, such a mensch, that he hardly knew me, and he said, look, anytime you're in Vermont, let me know, you can stay at my place. And we had met like just part of one day in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Now, go Bill. Let's say offer goes for everybody here. <laughs> All right, and <laughs> so I want to make a couple more comments, I, 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 and, and you know, I feel very strongly, and I think this is about as inspiring as a talk as I've ever heard in my life. And you're to be credited, Bill, but you're too humble to say much in your own honor. But I, I'm not shy about doing that. And um, he would never say this, or even he, some other people probably have thought it. But in addition to trying to get involved with Bill and going down to Washington and this kind of thing, I mean, now that I've heard the um, you know, transcendent huge amount of stuff that has happened since you started 350.org, I think there are people in this room could think about uh, emailing the Nobel Prize people and suggesting Bill's name for the Nobel Peace Prize. And it may not happen right away, but this man ought to be, and, and it isn't because he uh. wants it, it's because it would draw attention to the, the movement that he's helped start. Um, so the good news. A couple you... last things about the media. Uh, question. I'll turn it into a question. Wouldn't it be great, Bill, if the media were more vigilant on this topic, and if some people around here want to work with me in the Center for Media Studies, I'm, you've made me want to repurpose my center, the Center for Media Studies at Rutgers, and get a new website and focus my center on media surveillance of this issue. So it's a, and that's my question. That's a good question. It's, it's actually, it actually is, um, it's actually been, um, American journalism's not most shining hour dealing with climate change, not even close, okay? Um, and when they've covered it, they've covered it badly with a kind of false balance that, you know, between uh, uh, pretending there was a controversy long after there was, and, but mostly they haven't covered it. Uh, Media Matters did a study last year and found that there would, had been, in the previous year, uh, uh, 48 times more coverage of the Kardashian wedding on network <laughs> TV than uh, of climate change. They did a study last year, found that over the last four years, the Sunday morning talk shows taken all together had devoted seven minutes to climate change. Somehow Meet the Press had managed to devote over the course of four years, they devoted six seconds to talking about climate change. So yeah, uh, there's big, Big trouble. The good news is, and it goes back to the earlier question, that increasingly, oddly enough, we're able to overcome at least a little bit of that by making our own media. When we did those arrests in Washington, at first nobody covered them at all. But pretty soon, we were sending out so many things through our own channels that most of the people who needed to know, you know, who sort of wanted to know about it, began to know about it. And by last week, I, I actually, I mean, it was the one time I've actually really felt sort of, um, uh, uh, it really it tickled me. Uh, some of you may know the historian Daniel Jurgen, who won the Pulitzer Prize for his book on oil. They're sort of great energy historian. And he gave an interview last week and said, this Keystone, this Keystone Pipeline is the most famous pipeline in the history of the planet, and it hasn't even been built yet. And when I read that, I thought, okay, good. At least that, you know, that, that we, we, we've accomplished something. So, yeah, it would be much easier if we, you know, had better media, but we don't, so we'll, we've got to do what we can with what we got. Great. Hi. Is it all right to one more? I'm sorry. Oh, you. Oh. Uh, thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. I just had a question about um, climate change. Is, are there any uh, non-human related carbon emission problems or climate change problems? And is there anything that we as humans can do about it? So there are, I mean, there's plenty of, um, I mean, carbon in the atmosphere before humans started burning coal and gas and oil came mainly from volcanoes, and that continues to provide some, though by now it's a very small percentage in comparison. Um, 
it's not just fossil fuels. Deforestation also provides human-caused deforestation, a fair amount of carbon in the atmosphere. Um, um, but we, you know, that's human-caused too. The thing that's really starting to become worrisome is that past a certain point, if you raise the temperature high enough, then you begin sort of the involuntary emission of both carbon and methane. Um, so if you melt the permafrost in the Arctic, for instance, which we're now doing at a pretty rapid rate, there are large quantities of carbon in the form of peat and things and methane trapped underneath. And if, if we reach the point where that release begins in earnest, then pretty much all bets are off, okay? We can still control the carbon thermostat a little bit if we you know, change our factories and cars and do smart things. But we don't have any control over the methane thermostat if we raise the temperature high enough. So that would be a good thing to avoid um, doing. I hate to break off the conversation. One more. All right. Just one more. We'll have, no, we'll have one more question because this woman has waited. Um, and then um, we, we hope you all will take this conversation home to your kitchens, to your cars, to your classrooms. Um, and we hope you'll come back here at Rutgers for many more such discussions, the next of which will occur two nights from now. Wednesday, 8 p.m., Cook Campus Center to hear our own Rutgers University Debate Union take on the question of shall Rutgers University divest from its fossil fuel holdings. So we'll have one final question um, and then wish you all um, a good night and see you in Washington, D.C. in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you for your generosity and thank you for taking my question. Um, thank you for what you do. I'm actually an environmental steward with Rutgers. I'm also um, the executive director of a nonprofit called Species Alliance, and I sometimes bum people out too, as we have a very grassroots effort of educating the public on the mass extinction that's occurring on the planet. And of course, climate change is a huge driver. Um, this is a very um, important conversation that everybody participates in, and I'm interested if you could please speak to um, what's happening policy-wise. We have a director of our EPA that's leaving. We have our president that has mentioned, you know, the need for taking care of this problem in his inauguration. So could you speak to uh, your projections on policy in sure. this next administration? Sure. Um, I think that left to their own devices, they'll do some stuff around the edges that won't transform the situation that we're in. Um, and I don't think that's really their fault. I think left to their own devices and things, there's really not that much more they can do. There's some. I mean, it would be easy for the president to stop the pipeline, for instance, and that would be big help. But um, if we expect transformative action, which is what we need, then we have to provide transformative movement that makes that happen, okay? So, you know, uh, LBJ didn't wasn't able to sign the Voting Rights Act because, you know, he deeply believed in voting rights or not. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. In some way, it didn't matter. What mattered was that people had built a movement that gave him the space and in some way left him no choice but to do that, okay? That's our job. I, I've given up long since worrying about the psyche of our presidents and you know, trying to outguess, you know, whatever. I don't think much of it matters. My sense from Washington is it's a game of power. And if our leaders sense that we can cause them more pain or give them more reward than the other side, then we will be able to make some progress. And if not, then not. That's how it works. That maybe shouldn't be how it works. Maybe we should, you know, respond to, just reason and, and, and whatever else, as I said earlier. But that given that is how it works, we know it. So that means we gotta do it. That means, you know, if we get you know, if we get twenty thousand people in Washington on Sunday, that'll be terrific. And if we get thirty thousand people, that'll be half again as terrific and 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 and, and cause that much more it's just like weighing things up at some level, you know. And uh, that's part of what movements are about, um, that passion and that spirit and that creativity. And 
Sometimes we got to spend our bodies, you know, and, and, and we will. There'll be more. Those of you who have it on your bucket list that you need to go to jail will give you <laughs> another opportunity or two before time is out, okay? But it takes movements, and it takes, and, and the final thing I'll just say is, it takes, uh, movements require that people get behind things that are m moving, okay? Sometimes people say, oh, you're just preaching to the choir, and there's some truth to that, but that's okay. If you can get the choir to sing loudly and the same tune at the same time, then you have some chance. It doesn't work to sing 58 different hymns, and just because you might like a particular hymn a little more than something else, you know, you still, I mean, if people are heading one way, that's, that's what to do. That's what movements look like. And we're finally beginning to get some that are big enough to matter. So that's why it's so exciting to see people joining in. Thank <laughs> you.